Do we like living in the little apartment above the garage that we moved into on the new property? Why will I never ever own alpacas? <laughs> and can you get any tax cuts or government subsidies, 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 that's gonna be a fun one, as a homestead versus being a farm? We're gonna talk about, well, we're gonna answer all those questions and many more in today's episode of Ask Homesteady. So let's jump in. vacation and I'm ready to answer your questions. It's time for another episode of Ask Homesteady. This is the weekly show that we do where we answer your questions. If you want to get a question answered on Ask Homesteady, it's pretty simple. All you have to do is ask a question in the comments section of any of our videos, but don't forget at the end or beginning of your question to put the hashtag Ask home study all one word so that we can find your question on Friday when we sit down to record Ask Home Study. We want to answer your questions, but we get hundreds of questions every week, and to find them all when I sit down and, and do this on Friday, that hashtag makes it so that your question will actually get on the show. And if you don't add the hashtag, you better hope that one of our regular viewers has added it for you, which happened today. Some people saved the day. Uh, if it doesn't have the hashtag in any of the section, it just doesn't get on the show. So it's not because I don't like you, it's just because I can't find your question. Let's get to answering questions. A few ask, well, maybe it was last week, whenever. We talked about the difference between a farm and a homestead in a recent Ask Home study. And uh, basically, I said, in my opinion, a farm versus a homestead. Uh, the definition is that a homestead is focused on self-sufficiency and feeding the family first, whereas a farm is focused on business and earning money first. A farm can still feed the family and a homestead can still run a business. It's just where's that primary focus? We had a couple follow-up questions regarding subsidies and tax benefits. So Pete asks, what tax breaks apply to homesteading expenses? Are there any? Are the tax breaks the same as farming? And uh, Keith West says to seek a professional. That is excellent advice. Keith is right. If you are looking to save money on your taxes, Pete, absolutely look for a professional. Now, I'm gonna throw this out there. While looking to a professional to save money on your taxes as a homesteader or farmer is a great decision, you will find professional tax people who don't work with farmers or homesteaders don't know every law that is out there. The tax code that exists for the United States is giant and there's very few people who could have the ability to remember all the codes that apply and there's federal codes and then there's state codes and even your own town might have its own legislation that applies where areas you could save money. So a perfect example, back in Connecticut, we were running a farm business from our homestead and right there in our town, there was an ordin ordinance called PA 490, which allowed you to save money on your taxes based off of earning an income as a farm. Now, let's talk about your question here, Pete. Uh, do tax breaks apply to homesteading expenses versus farming? So generally speaking, Pete, and again, I can't answer for the entire tax code, but from what I've experienced in our eight years now of doing this, uh, the tax breaks that are out there usually focus on properties that are producing a product as a farm. Now that doesn't mean you have to be a giant farm or a full-time farmer, as was the case with our Squash Hollow farm. Uh, all we had to do to save money on our property taxes was to show that we were earning some sort of money from agricultural sales. Certain towns in Connecticut were more strict about this than others. Certain tax assessors were more strict than others. So whereas one person could say, hey, I'm selling farm fresh eggs and get property tax reduction, another person would have had to show a serious business going to the farmer's market. So I can't tell you cut and dry what you're going to experience. However, I can tell you where to look. Uh, start with your town hall and work your way out. Town hall, uh, state codes, and then federal. You can save money on taxes with property taxes if you're doing some sort of farming business. 
Uh, you can save money on sales tax that you pay when purchasing things for your farm, again, if it's a business in some states. Other states uh, look at land usage. I know of farmers, or I know of homesteaders actually, uh, who hay their fields. They don't even sell the hay. They just pay it and put it on the side of the road and put a sign up hay for sale. And I'm sure they would sell it if someone came by to buy it, uh, but they don't actively market that hay. They don't push that hay. Just the fact that they're haying and putting the sign out hay for sale in their state allows them tax uh, tax reduction on property taxes. So where do you, how, how do you find out what you can do, Pete? Uh, first off, again, look at your town hall, uh, look at your state codes online and federally what you can do. A tax professional like Accountant Mike can help with that. Uh, find someone who's familiar with your town and find someone who works with farmers. They'll be a lot better off to tell you what to do. Now, is there any kind of tax breaks that are just for homesteaders? Well, the Homesteading Act is done. You can't go and get you know, free land out west because you're gonna homestead. Uh, generally, the, all the tax code savings I have seen focus on people who are producing a product. And the whole point of the tax reduction is not because the government likes farmers just for the sake of the fact that they're farmers, uh, the idea is that farming is important, feeding people farm fresh food is important, feeding people food period is important, and if you have to buy acres and acres of land and spend lots of money on infrastructure to produce that food, the government sees the value in that food production. They understand that the property might have a much higher value to someone building condos, however, someone building condos doesn't produce food for you or me. And so those tax cuts exist so that people can own hundreds and hundreds of acres and produce large scale amounts of food to feed people. However, in writing that code, uh, they did not leave out the little farms. And so generally homesteaders who smartly design a business from their homestead can save some money in taxes like we did at Squash Hollow uh, by doing some sort of farming business. But if you're a homestead first who just has a small farm business, uh, yes, a homesteader can save money on taxes. If you're just a homestead who's feeding yourselves, usually it's hard to find tax cuts. However, if you're smart like the people with the hay and the sign hay for sale, maybe you can find some loopholes that will work for you. Hope that helps. I know it's vague, but it will point you in the right direction to getting a good answer depending on your state, your town, and uh, where you live specifically. Kind of a similar question, um, more focused on money being given to farmers as opposed to money saved in taxes. Moving on asks, do some farmers get government subsidies as, farms, as farmers, but homesteaders usually do not qualify? I guess they're saying, why? Do, why does that happen? What's the difference and which is better as a producer to qualify as? When we talk about subsidies, uh, what we're talking about, what I'm going to talk about here, uh, agricultural subsidies are another area where just there's so much you could dive into. Uh, there's probably books worth of information out there on government subsidies. We're talking about the United States here and uh, what they do to get farmers, essentially help farmers, give farmers more money. Uh, there seems to be the opinion amongst some homesteaders that farmers get all the good subsidies. Uh, the big farmers, there's nothing for the little guy anymore. So when we talk about subsidies, we're just essentially going to say government giving money to somebody doing agricultural work. So can a homesteader get the same thing as a big farmer? Why or why not? We're going to talk about this just briefly here because, again, Tons of information out there and I don't have enough experience in large scale agriculture to understand how all their subsidies work. Uh, we're just going to talk about kind of a high level thing and how a homesteader can take advantage of what's out there. So for the most part, uh, what you see in the farm bill every year that's passed, farmers get help from the government. They get help in the form of money. Uh, we talked already about tax cuts, um, money being given to them. Uh, to leave land not worked, uh, money being given them for different projects that they do. Um, 
if you're producing a lot of food, you are the ones who the government identifies as the important ones to keep in business. A homesteader who's selling a dozen eggs to his friends and family is not helping feed the nation and so the government doesn't care to keep you in money for your farm fresh eggs just so you can sell them to your friends and family and you can all enjoy farm fresh eggs. So no, a lot of the money is not going to small homesteads or family farms. Now this hasn't always been the case. We think about the word homesteader comes from the Homestead Act of the late 1800s and a homesteader in the Homestead Act, what they were required to do was they would get their plot of land and they had to work the land and survive off that land for five years. They did not have to run a business. Of course, some of them would have sold goods and with the money they earned from that, they would have then purchased things they needed. The focus there was on family farms. Now, the world is different. The goals of the government now are not to influence people to move out west so that we can lay claim to ownership of the west. The United States borders are secure. We know who lives there and we're not the government is not trying to get people to move anywhere in the country to farm it and take over it so that they can have it for their own. Now the government's concern is feeding the population and helping farmers to do that. Of course, there were plenty of people who will argue that that's not the government's concern. Uh, we're not going to get into politics. We're just talking about can homesteaders get subsidies. So while there is no Homestead Act anymore, uh, you can't get money from the government or land from the government, which is what the Homestead Act was. It was actually you got that land, not any money. So even there, it's kind of a subsidy. You know, you're getting the land for a minimum fee, what they had to uh, pay to get the paperwork done. Nothing's free when it comes to bureaucracy and the government. <laughs> You can get government grants even at a homestead scale. How? You have to produce value. Like anything in life, if you want money to come to you, you have to produce value because that's what people pay money for, something they find valuable. The government is no different. So how can you get money from the government? Well, there are grants that even smaller family farms can take advantage of. My neighbor at Squash Hollow uh, had a grant to put in some earthworks on his property. The government, through the USDA, he applied for this grant. Uh, they drew up plans for work to be done. What's in it for them? Well, he was going to work on avoiding erosion, improving the watershed on that piece of property. Avoiding erosion and improving the watershed helps everybody downstream of that. And so the government is willing to give a homesteader or a small farm the money to do that. Now they did have a farm business. They were producing goods. They were not just a family selling eggs to their friends and family. Uh, however, they were mostly focused on their own homestead and their own family first. They just also had a business. Uh, we talked about this in the last question there. Uh, having some sort of business off your homestead usually helps with this sort of thing they were going to get money from the government to do this project. Now, you could do this for, there are certain projects out there the government will grant you, they will give you a grant to do, uh, putting up hoop houses, uh, working on erosion problems, uh, putting in fences for grazing animals, are just some examples of what people have received grants for. If you propose a, a study that you're going to perform from your homestead, you can get grants given to you from that. So you can get some government money to help you on your homestead if you provide value. No one's going to give you money because you want to have chickens, but the government will give you some money if you do something they want done. Now here is the scary part about getting subsidies from the government. The minute you take the government's money, guess who gets to make all the decisions with regards to the project? The government. <laughs> I know a lot of homesteaders out there don't like that idea of letting the government come onto their property and tell them what to do. Like all things in life, if someone's paying for it, they're in control. The customer is always right. In this case, it is the government and they get to run the show. With what happened with my neighbor back at Squash Hollow, um, the government came in, they told him how long the project would take, they told him how much the project would cost and when it was to be done by. 
I have some very inside information here because uh, my dad is an excavator. He runs an excavating business and he was the one who was going to do the work. So ready for this? Both sides of the story here. Now I'm not giving any way private information. I'm not telling you uh, who my neighbor was. I'm not telling you uh, which farm it was. I had a lot of farmer neighbors back in Connecticut. So uh, long story short, what happened was that project was gonna cost way more money just in materials. The amount of money the government was willing to give wasn't enough to even cover the materials. It was going to take much longer than what the government employee said it was going to take. And what happens if you don't meet the deadlines? They don't give you any of the money. You wind up spending your own money and you don't get the reimbursement because they get to call the shots. So is it worth it? Well, that's a question you have to answer for yourself moving on. If you have a small homestead and you have some projects you wanna do, it might seem tempting to go ask the local grant person uh, to work you know, on a project, get some government money to build yourself a hoop house or put up some fencing, but then you're gonna have a government employee coming to your property, inspecting to make sure it's done according to the way they want it done. That doesn't mean right. Just because a government employee thinks it should be done a certain way does not mean that is the best thing you should do on your homestead. I worked in the construction field for, uh, for 15 years with my father who built homes his entire life. The man knew more, my dad knew more about construction and earthworks than 99, 100% of the government employees we worked with because he actually did the work for decades whereas they just looked at manuals and pointed at things they didn't like the looks of. But they get to call the shots because they have the manual and the government position. And so many a time with heads shaking, we would have to change something on a job because some government official said he wanted it a certain way even though the man with the most experience, my father, who had been doing this for decades, knew it was the wrong decision to make, the government official gets to make the right, make the right decision because they call the shots. So while it might be tempting to get a wad of cash to help you put up some fencing, there might be some better ways to do that. Like for example, create value in the form of a product, goat meat. <laughs> pig meat, milk. Get people to prepay for a share of the product you're going to produce. Use those deposits to put up your fencing and then sell them their pork at the end of the year and uh, repeat the cycle and grow slowly without having any government officials needing to come and inspect and get all nosy on your property because the Lord knows once they get the foot in the door, okay, I'll stop. Maybe some of you watching are government officials. You're not all bad. There were a couple good ones, so don't get mad if you're a government inspector and you have a lot of experience. I have a very good friend back in Connecticut who is an inspector who does have lots of experience, so they're not all bad. But we had so many experiences with ones who were just underqualified in what they had actually done in life, but overqualified in their title, and it went to their head, and it just... <sighs> Let's answer another question. The next question, uh, Matthew says, where do your guinea fowl stay at night? Do they use a coop or roost in the wild? Matthew, one of the hardest things of owning guineas is getting them to stay alive. I love guineas, they're great for tick management. They're good watchdogs. They make a ton of noise when anything happens. So if you're cool with that, uh, I'm not exactly cool with that, but they're so good for ticks that I just deal with it. But getting the guineas to stay alive is really hard. They're flighty, wildy birds, and at the quickest, like, littlest amount of a bad influence on a flock, and they will just go roost in the trees and one by one get killed, and next year you'll have to do a whole nother round of guineas. My mother-in-law is especially good at domesticating guineas. Uh, over the years she has raised guineas uh, and got them to be more domestic in the form of uh, they'll roost in the barn or at least within the fencing of the barn. Uh, we at Squash Hollow were able to have some more domestic guineas. So what we have found in our experience, 
to keep your guineas roosting ours currently are roosting on the fencing within the perimeter of the barn fence so they're pretty safe there they used to fend, roost inside the barn uh, what helps is hatching guinea keats not getting them as keats if you can get eggs and hatch them and the best thing to do is hatch them under a broody hen who goes back into the coop faithfully every night uh, she can train them and they become more domesticated guineas if the hen teaches them to roost inside generally they will keep roosting inside unless they come into contact with another group of guineas who are roosting outside or another kind of bird like for example if you have turkeys who like to roost outside uh, any bad influence birds are going to change their mind and get them to roost back outside so get guinea eggs hatch them under a birdie hen and for the love of Pete do not allow them to come into contact with outside roosting birds because they will change their mind if you have guineas that are roosting outside and the flock is dwindling let them all die before you raise your next batch or apparently they're good eating so you know that's always an option just stink a lot I like the little skunk with the top hat it's a good thing sir stink a lot you lightly touched the fodder production topic on your video and I wanted to ask you about your thoughts on hydroponic green fodder also, if you think creative feeding practices can help milk and meat production be more sustainable. Uh, thanks for your content. Cheers. So, uh, Sir Stinkalot is asking about, in the previous Ask Home study, we talked about fodder. A lot of people ask, what about growing fodder for your animals as opposed to buying grain? And uh, then I briefly talked about other creative feeding practices. And what I mean by that is, different types of feeding practices that are not going to the store and buying a bag of feed and giving it to your animals. And I mentioned in that Ask Home study how I just feel that most of these creative ways to feed your animal, you spend way more time doing them and time is money. So they are, while they might save you some money in the long run, they might not be because of the time they're costing you as a small homestead. They might make more sense for a bigger production, but not for a homesteader. If you have one cow, you're not gonna save money by doing a hydroponic green fodder instead of buying grain for your cow. Uh, applies to the hydroponic green fodder. So just think a lot. Uh, most fodder, um, a lot of the fodder processes are essentially very much similar to hydroponics or are hydroponics. A lot of fodder is grown inside with grow lights. Uh, hydroponic fodder would just be fodder grown in a water hydroponic system with the nutrients added to it. They can grow quicker in a hydroponic system. Plants grow quicker in a hydroponic system. Uh, but do I think it makes sense to feed animals with hydroponic fodder? Not for the sake of saving money. Uh, again, the time you're gonna invest in a hydroponic system to feed those animals, the time you're gonna spend doing that, if, you're, if your goal is to save money, you're gonna be spending a lot of time working on your hydroponic system. So if your goal is just to create a really cool cyclical, you know, grow your hydroponics and then feed your animals with it, cool, go for it, that's fun. But if the goal is to save money, then I, I don't suggest these creative feeding processes. I just don't think they pan out most of the time. Uh, as far as are these creative feeding practices helping make milk and meat production more sustainable? Um, that is, whether milk and meat production are sustainable, that's one of those very vague slash complex things that is hard to talk about. Uh, people will disagree. Scientists will disagree completely with each other. You'll have one scientist who tells you uh, that milk production is the worst thing for the planet. And then the next scientist who tells you the planet cannot exist without livestock, and so milk production is important. So it's so big of a question. Uh, the creative feeding practices, can they help make it more sustainable? It's just too hard to answer that, so stink a lot. Um, I guess they could improve some, some of the problems could be improved with it. It's too big. I'm not even going to go there, so stink a lot. It's just too big of a question. I do want to, in the future, make a video. Very soon, we're going to make a video about kind of the war on milk because 
people are being told that milk is the worst thing for the planet and uh, you should not be drinking cow's milk because it just takes too much nutrients and people aren't supposed to drink milk anyway. We're going to talk about that in a future video. Um, so, And we'll cover some of that whole is milk sustainable sort of questions and meat too. So we'll get to some of that in that future video, but not in a Q&A. Sorry, stink a lot. Sir, stink a lot. Forgive me. There's, I don't know, it's funny how many of the, of the questions today kind of relate to each other. Here's another one that involves kind of the government and homesteading. Uh, my Vizla says, Aust, in my opinion, city dwellers should raise more than the limit of meat chickens. So we talked about in a past Ask Homesteady, uh, city dwellers who had as many chickens as their town ordinance would allow them, and now they were looking to do something new because they didn't want to get more chickens than they were supposed to. And this person, my visa says they should have more meat chickens than they're supposed to. The birds will only be there for a few weeks. By the time a neighbor finds out and complains, the birds will be processed and they'll be in the freezer. Meat birds will only be noticeable to neighbors for a few weeks. And then Jennifer adds in, people doing this is what causes cities to just ban birds in the city outright. When you choose to go against city ordinance because you bank on being caught in time, it makes your neighbors upset. Those neighbors complain year after year until the city decides that the limit is zero. If you want to raise meat birds beyond the limit allowed in the city, then don't live in the city. <laughs> and this is, no one asked a question, but they did hash, do the hashtag ask home study just to share this topic. And so I figured we'll touch on it because I like both points. Um, my Vizla is thinking creatively, and as often the case with local and small government, uh, asking forgiveness is going to be better than asking permission. So if you live in a town that says you can't have chickens, then usually if you want to have chickens, you should just get your chickens, and then when they come and say you can't have chickens, you get rid of them. <laughs> and that's what my Vizla is saying. And then Jennifer, MWB says, don't do that, you're making it worse for everybody. So what should somebody do who lives in a town who says you can't have chickens? First, go find it in writing. Because just because your neighbor says you can't have chickens, doesn't mean that's actually the case. Maybe the town says per acre you can have so many chickens. So go to the town hall and don't take anyone's word for it, Ask, where is it in the town code? I want to see what the town code actually says. If it's not in the code, then have your chickens. The reason you want to see what it says is because you want to be able to be smart and work the system against itself without being one of those people who ruins it for everyone like Jennifer talks about. You want to have a homestead, but you live in the city. Jennifer's advice is good, don't live in the city. But you live in the city and you don't want to wait till you can afford to move out. So what do you do? You get that town ordinance and then you read it very carefully. And it says, you cannot have chickens in the city limits. It doesn't say you cannot have ducks. It doesn't say you cannot have quail. It doesn't say you cannot have rabbits. You go out and you get all three. And the products you get from those ducks and rabbits and quail, you share those with your neighbors and you tell them, here, have a f half a dozen free duck eggs. Aren't those amazing? Wouldn't it be nice if we could have chickens in this town too? Because I'd have chickens too. And you change people's minds without breaking the laws, but work in the system against itself. You go as far as you can without being the person ruining it for everyone by acting creatively. If you can't have chickens, quail are not chickens. And you know how much work it will be for them to change the code so that it says quail also are not allowed? It'll be a lot of work. And if everybody in your town loves the quail because you've been giving them free eggs, no one's gonna see that done. That's how, when you live in the city, you can still make it work. That I like. As you can tell, these small government, like local government, the little small town government stuff just, it bugs me so much. My parents owned two acres of land. When we first decided we were going to start a little farm and we didn't own Squash Hollow, they said, you guys can build on that two acres, go ahead. Guess what? 
two acres of land, the town that that land was in, they would not allow one chicken in two acres of land. What kind of morons made an ordinance that with two acres, you couldn't have one chicken? I have no problem saying that those people are morons because it's two acres. If your neighbor doesn't like chickens, oh well, he's two acres away from you. You can't have one chicken. You couldn't have any livestock on two acres. How are you supposed to be self-sufficient? How are you supposed to take care of your family and you know have a little something in case times get tough if two acres you're not allowed to have livestock? I couldn't believe it. If we had not looked into it first, we just said, oh, we got two acres, let's do it. We could have spent $100,000 building a small, modest home there, only to find out, guess what? You can't feed your family from your land because you can't have no, any livestock. That's why I get annoyed at this, this local government stuff and the rules and regulations. Any way you can outsmart it, it's not smart. Whoever made that is not smart, so any way you can outsmart it, do it. Next question. But don't break the law, just be smart. Next question. I'm getting all worked up today. That's usually make for a better Q&A anyway. Speaking of getting chickens, Renee says she'd like to get three dash four chickens, but I know next to nothing about birds. I've had parakeets, but nothing in the yard. How much trouble are chickens comparatively? Also, I live under a live oak tree. I've heard oak is poisonous for chickens. Is that true? Last question. What do you wish you had known before you got your first chickens? So Renee, if you've had parakeets, then you know as much about birds as you absolutely need to for chickens. <laughs> they need a place to live, they need some feed, they need to be cleaned up after, and uh, these birds you can actually let out of the thing and it won't be absolute mayhem. So they'll come back at night as opposed to your parakeets when they get out. <laughs> I once had a conure as a pet, a little peach front conure, and it got out one day and that thing flew across our town. We were driving around town and the bird could talk, so we're going, hello, hello, hello. That was fun. Chickens are like big parakeets. If you've taken care of parakeets, you're all right. They are easier than parakeets because they don't live in your house. They can be a little bit messier. And as far as what they need, well, they need some feed, they need some water, so do parakeets but your chicken pops out a real big egg every couple of days or every day, almost every day. Whereas a parakeet, I don't know when they pop out those eggs and probably don't get much from them. So yeah, go for chickens if you don't have much experience. They are a great animal to start with. They are the gateway homestead animal. No worries. Now you live under a live oak tree. You've heard oak is poisonous for chickens. You Google uh, poisonous plants for livestock, you'll find all kinds of but differing opinions and contradictions and people saying yes, people saying no. So is oak poisonous for chickens? Well, I'm not gonna say yes or no to that. If you boil down an oak tree and you make oak juice and you feed only that to your chicken, will it kill it? Maybe. Comment below if you have any experience with oaks har harming your chickens. However, I can tell you, I live on properties, both of my homesteads have been on properties with oak trees, giant oak trees raining down acorns and I have never had a problem with a chicken being poisoned by oak trees. So while you might find something on the internet, if you Google it right now saying chickens are allergic to oaks, is it actually gonna be a problem for you? Probably not. If you feed your chickens a good feed and you provide them all their needs, they're not gonna be popping acorns. <laughs> now, if you don't feed them, you say, go ahead, eat the oak trees. Well, then well, you're doing a scientific study and maybe you can get a grant for that. Trixie. Are you concerned about CWD in deer in your area? CWD is chronic wasting disease. It is a disease that kills deer. Am I worried about it? No. So far as science has proven, CWD cannot be transferred to humans. If you have newer science on that, comment below. Trust me, I want to know. <laughs> uh, but. As far as I know, no studies have found that to transfer to humans. CWD, it, uh, it's a disease that deer get. It winds up in the spinal system, in the brain. So if you don't eat the brain and the spinal fluids and all that, when you're butchering, you don't saw through any of that stuff. You, you're not gonna come in contact with it anyway. However, 
You can usually tell if a deer has chronic wasting disease. Just Google it and you'll see images of deer. They look sickly. And if I were to shoot a deer, well, let me just say, I would not shoot a deer that looked that sickly with the intention of eating it. I might shoot it to put it out of its misery. But if a deer is that sickly looking, I don't want to feed my family something that's sickly if I don't know why it's that sickly. So I am very little worry about CWD because I'm not going to feed a sickly looking deer to my family. CWD makes deer look very sickly and if I got a deer that had just gotten chronic wasting disease and he still looked good and I didn't know it, the chance of me coming in contact with it is very slim and they have not proven it to do anything to humans. So all in all, not something I'm worried about. If you have better update science on that, link below for a scientific study that shows that, not somebody who commented on a blog saying it made their parents go crazy. Diana, are you preparing a garden area, not ours, for next year? Um, kind of. So Diana, here in the house, the big house, there are three beautiful raised beds. And by the time spring comes, we really hope to be in this house by then, <laughs> they will then be our raised beds. However, I believe there's some garlic already in them, which my mother-in-law's, it's her garlic, and that'll be hers. So I can't take that raised bed. I'm not a huge gardener, as many of you longtime viewers know, I'm not really into veggies. But I don't mind having a little kitchen garden by the kitchen and some herbs in the window, and that's what we use to raise beds for. Something you can, you know, sit out on a lawn chair, drink a beer, do some weeding. That works for me. Speaking of my mother-in-law and my in-laws, uh, it's amazing how all the questions are just flowing today. It works real good. Amanda says, how do you guys coordinate the kids going to grandparents' house? We're moving next door to my parents. We also homeschool so the kids are always around. I'm wondering how to balance their desire to see granny, eat cookies, and watch TV versus do farm chores, yard work, and school work. Okay, so Amanda, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna answer this exactly from our particular experience as like what we do because what we have right now is very temporary. My in-laws live right next to us. You can throw a rock out the window and it can land in their bedroom. But that will be my bedroom in the future, so I will not throw a rock into my future bedroom and break my future window. This is very temporary, so we haven't treated this like we would have if we were gonna be here a long time. I have good friends who live right next to their parents and they're not going anywhere. They're right next to their parents. And uh, it's a different dynamic over a long period of time. Right now, it's been really nice having moved. Uh, all the work you ha we had to do with moving and then heavy farming, getting onto this new farm and having to do stuff. Having our in-laws right, my in-laws right here, Case parents, has been great. We have had to kind of put a little bit of a some rules to when they can go see grandma. Otherwise, they would probably be here every day. Like you said, watching you know, something, eating cookies, playing with grandma. Uh, so we have had to buckle down. It's easier on the older ones than the younger ones. Um, so if I were living here, if this was it, if we were always gonna be next door, like it sounds like you're going to be, uh, I would say your older ones are much easier to just make rules. You just don't go over without asking. And if you have farm work to do, I mean, it's not optional. One of the good ways to drive that home, we've seen with our older ones, and our olders are eight and six, turning seven, give them the animals and let them reap the benefits. So my son gets to make money from selling eggs. They are his chickens. He's proud of his chickens, they are his, but he's gotta do his chores. Sorry, I know you wanna go over and play, but they're your chickens. You make the money from them, you gotta do the work. You don't want to do the work, we'll sell the chickens, you won't make any more money. We don't give our kids an allowance. I don't want my children to learn that they automatically get money from the universe. That's not how adulthood works. <laughs> Unless you're on uh, welfare, uh, we won't go there. We're doing enough angry government stuff today. The way you make money as an adult, a responsible adult is by creating value and I want my kids to learn that right away so we did not give them a regular allowance every week without you know any change instead 
we give them little businesses. You get the eggs. If you do really good with your chickens and you collect those eggs and you keep them clean and you move them, you smile at people and tell them about your chickens, you'll make a lot of, you know, egg money. If you don't take care of your chickens and the eggs get nasty and you don't collect them, they get covered in poop and you don't tell anybody about them, you're not going to make any money. So giving them the animal and giving them the value, it teaches a lot of lessons. And then they really don't have an option. They got to go do their farm work. Sorry, it's part of, you know, the deal. <laughs> as far as letting them go over to the in-laws, you got to talk to your in-laws a lot, of, or your, whose parents is it? Your parents? It's your parents. So you got to talk to your parents. You got to see what they're up for and uh, just enforce the rules that are there. So what is good with my in-laws might not be the same for yours. It's important to establish that before you get there and feelings get hurt. And that might change. There's a honeymoon period where you're living next door and everything's wonderful and that's great. And for the first couple weeks, it might be like, hey, they're at grandma's every day, all day long. It's great. But that probably won't work forever. I don't know, maybe it will. Uh, you gotta have an open communication and you gotta keep it open. So we have, with the kids, we have rules as to when they can come, when they can go. They can't just go on their own. Uh, we either ask before with a text or we walk them over. Uh, or we just say, no, it's your time to be at our house. And they've learned that. Even the little ones have learned they can't just go over on their own. They need us to be involved in that decision. And, uh, you know, treat it responsibly and respectfully. It is a very nice, if you are homesteading, it is nice to have that. Another question we're going to get to in a minute here. We'll uh, dwell into, delve into that. Uh, but the point is, don't abuse it. So... Whenever we, like, for example, we had a doctor appointment yesterday, and it would have been very easy to just drop the kids off at grandma, they're right there, but we didn't because we don't need to. We, for 10 years, didn't live next door. We did it on our own. We don't need to. So we try not to take advantage of it because it's so close and it's easy to do. We try not to take advantage of it too much. Uh, I think with any relationship, family that's close like that, you need to have good open communication. Keep that open. What started off good might not continue to be good. And at all times, try not to take advantage of things and be as helpful as you can be on the other end. And uh, it should work out good if you follow that kind of thing there. And with your kids, just establish the rules and enforce them, you know, like all things with kids. Establish your rules clearly and enforce them, and then they know what to expect. Doesn't mean they'll always listen, but... Not too long ago, my wife shot a magnet down Luna's throat, and people had some questions about that. Sathis, who uh, leaves a lot of questions. Hey, Sathis. He's a super fan of the show. I assume. You watch a lot of videos and comment a lot, Sathis, so I'm going to presume that you're a super fan. He says, can you attach small magnet blocks to the mower to pick up nails and other metals? So essentially, shooting the magnet down the cow is to collect hardware, nails and things. So Sathis is saying, why not just put it on the mower, and as you mow, you can suck them all up. Good idea, Sathis. Uh, might be something to that, creating like a mower magnet thing. I wouldn't trust it to do everything. And one reason why is because I have seen like metal needles in carpets not get picked up by magnets. I was testing out a, ma a magnet we had and I took a sewing needle, put it in a carpet and ran it over and ran it over and ran it over. And because the needle got kind of interwoven in the carpet, it wouldn't get picked up by the magnet. And I imagine that could happen outside as well. You're dealing with grass and leaves and twigs and a cow's hoof could step on a nail and kind of push it down into the dirt. And then a quick magnet going over the top wouldn't be enough to pull it out. But a cow ripping up grass and loosening the dirt could then wind up with it in its body. So cool idea, but I wouldn't trust only that to avoid hardware disease, which is what we're trying to avoid, hardware disease. Speaking of mowing, I mean, this is just, it's like flowing perfect. You guys, way to go. Bill watched me mowing the field with a mower that didn't have any magnets on it, and he saw the drone footage dun, 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 going around the tractor and he said it really added to the storytelling, but then he wanted to know, while I'm driving a tractor telling you about how I almost flipped a tractor, who's driving the drone? Are you driving a tractor 
and the drone and flipping over a drone and flipping over a tractor. Bill, Jesse commented on this, the drone flew itself in follow me mode. Bingo, Jesse. Um, Mavic Air is the kind of drone that I have and it has some, I specifically chose the Mavic Air because it has some very smart features. I can, on my phone, highlight the tractor I'm in, say, follow me, go, and then I can drive the tractor and the drone follows me. And then I can say, circle me, and the drone circles me. And then I can say, zoom in, zoom out. It can do all kinds of really cool things, which allows me to drive a tractor or drive an ATV or walk through a field. All the times you see me where the drone is on me, it's, it's doing a smart mode. Now there are times where I drive the drone if someone else is driving the ATV or the car because to be honest, while there are a lot of smart features, it's only as sophisticated as a smart feature can be in this day and age. So there are times where it's just better to fly it yourself. But nobody else in my family flies drones, it's just me. So if it's filming me, it's on the smart mode. Rachel, I have an off topic question group of questions. Have you ever thought of doing any fiber farming? What goes into farming fiber? Is there a decent market for it or is the work just not worth it? I guess long story short, will you guys ever make a fiber video? A little harder to find info on it from other homesteading videos. It's hard to find homesteaders doing fiber businesses for a reason, Rachel, because it's hard to run a fiber business. And I know this for two reasons. First off, I had neighbor farmers, I told you I had a lot of neighbor farmers back at Squash Hollow. Uh, I had neighbor farmers who did fiber and they did not make any money from the fiber. They got out of doing fiber and used the animals they were using for fiber uh, as kind of like a tourist thing to bring people onto their property. So, yeah, that didn't work for them. And then I interviewed Elaine Vandiver from Walla Walla Washington's Old Homestead Alpacas. Hit her up on Instagram. She's got an awesome Instagram. Tell her you heard about her on Homesteady because we're buds. And yeah, Elaine talked about her fiber business. She actually took a course. We did a Homesteady business course a couple years back, me and accountant Mike, and helped some budding homestead entrepreneurs solve their problems and get their businesses off and running. Elaine had a fiber business and she could not make money work with the fiber business because here's how fiber works. You have a bunch of alpacas. I'm sorry to hear that. You then have to shear the alpacas fiber off them. Then you take that fiber and alpaca people, if I get a step in this process wrong, be kind in the comments. You can correct me, just be kind because I'm not into alpacas. I'm never getting alpacas. So I might not be totally accurate on how this works, but I know how it doesn't work, and that's it doesn't make money. You shear the alpacas, off comes the alpaca wool, and then you have to like spin that, and then you have to send it off to be dyed. And essentially what Elaine told me, the process of getting an alpaca to getting a sock is like three years. If you want to run a business, one of the most important things right out of the gate is cash flow. Not being profitable, just cash flow. Knowing that you can spend money and tomorrow more will come in. Even if it's not profitable, if you can keep the cash flow, you can get to profitability. And with a farm, trust me, it's going to be a long time before you're profitable. But if you don't have cash flow, you're just spending money, you're dead in the water. Eventually you're going to run out of your money. and well, you're gonna fail. That's why you don't hear a lot of homesteaders talking about their fiber business because three years from getting your alpaca to getting a pair of socks to sell, by then you're out of business. You need to get something to market much quicker. If you're really into fiber and you're really into, like you wanna do that, I'm not saying don't do it. You just need to know ahead of time it's gonna take you three years and before you focus on selling socks and hats and sweaters, you need to come up with an MVP, a minimum viable product that you can get to market quickly and make money from. For Elaine, that was agro-tourism, then it became flowers, 
And you can learn so much more about this in our podcast. If you don't listen to our podcast, there's a link below for it. Go over to iTunes. There's a very, I shouldn't say very recent because we haven't done a podcast since we moved. I know everybody, I'm getting to it this winter once I have a good studio. There's an interview with Elaine all about what she did with her business and why fiber was challenging. You can learn all about that. Go to iTunes, search Homesteady. You'll find about the third or fourth podcast episode from the last one we did, which was in May, was Elaine and uh, talking about agro-tourism, alpacas, all that. I will never own alpacas. They are a goofy animal. I know you love your alpacas, alpaca people, but they're just goofy looking. I helped my neighbors with the alpacas out a lot. I, they were great neighbors. <laughs> One day I was working on my computer and I looked out the window and we lived on like this back road, you know, not in town or nothing. I looked out the window and I saw a bunch of alpacas going down the road. And I said, hey Kay, I think they're having an alpaca parade. And then I was like, wait a second, nobody lives down that end of the road. That end of the road just heads to the main highway. The alpacas are loose. There was no alpaca parade. There's never an alpaca parade. Next Homesteady shirt. There's no alpaca parade. Kristen wants to know, are your cats inside or outside cats? If they are all outside, how do they react to your other animals? Did you have to train them? Because you know training cats works out so well. Kristen, don't tell any of those cat people. All of our cats are outside cats. We have a farm. There are rodents on every farm because there's feed and there's animals and there's mess. Rodents love that, so they come. Cats are awesome at killing rodents. And when you have a farm, people bring you cats. And you're like, well, I didn't want your cat, but now I have it, and I also have rodents, so we're all good. Barn cats are a great thing, and some places understand that. Agricultural places definitely understand that. Pennsylvania gets it. <laughs> uh, back in Connecticut, it was harder to find barn cats. They usually found you. People would drop off cats. So for us, we have barn cats. They work great at rodent control. Uh, you know, you put out a litter box, you feed them, you actually do feed them, and you give them a warm space and you keep, you know, the dog from chasing them or whatever. And uh, they kind of, I don't think you ever train a cat. You know, cats are wild killers. But you can establish a symbiosis where you provide food and an easy place to pee, and uh, they'll take care of your mice population. And, you know, you both come to an agreement. You don't poop in my swing set area, mulch, and uh, I won't let the dog attack you. We good? We good. Homestead housewife, new chicken owner, congratulations. Bought a square bale of hay at Tractor Supply. Don't, you're getting price gouged. To use in the nest boxes. I have no idea how to store hay or the best way to cut it apart. How to tell if it's moldy. I think if I've, I think I've heard to change it once a week. Should I cover the bale with a tarp? It's in a covered carport area, but still exposed to lots of humidity down south. And you do a video about that. We kind of did a video about that. We did a video about hay not too long ago. And you saw where we stored it in the upper loft of our barn. Hay, if it has moisture in it, it can lose it. So you stand the hay bale up on end and it can lose that moisture open the doors of the area and let that pass through. Now, I don't know about how your down south humidity will affect your hay. Um, for your nest boxes, you can, instead of doing hay, you can do wood chips. So if you're having problems with hay, and if you're buying it from Tractor Supply, you're probably getting price gouged, just get wood chips. Get the big flakes, easier. The hay kind of gets nasty in nest boxes if you don't change it often, but if you change it often, then you don't need to worry about storing hay. Don't put a tarp over it, because that won't let it breathe. Uh, keep the hay out, off the ground if it's wet. If it's in a covered area, that's good. If there's airflow, that's great. And if you're going through, you know, each day, pull out the bad stuff. That whole change it once a week thing, that, that's more of what does it look like. Look in your nest boxes. They're pooping that hay. 
pick it up and flip it over. If there's a lot of hay there, the poop will now be on the bottom and the hay, good hay is on the top. Next day come out, flip it over, oh, there's poop on both sides, replace it. So just see what kind of need you have. Depending on your chickens, how many nest boxes you have, how often you swap it, will depend on whether or not you need to wait once a week or once every day. That, that changes a lot. But that's one of those things. Just, I hate when people make up these rules like, change your nest boxes once a week. Well, no, change them when they need changed. Just pay attention and, you know, if it's full of poop, change it and don't let it get full of poop next time. Make sure you change it before it's full of poop. The moldiness. I mean, you can tell if it's moldy. You just kind of open it up and smell it and look at it. But don't smell too much. You don't want to get mold like in your lungs. Just kind of pee, pee, you'll see mold dust. Good hay shouldn't be moldy. Um, yeah. Don't over, I mean, it's just hay for nest boxes. Don't overthink it too much. Just, and, and use wood chips if the hay is expensive and it's getting moldy. Dean wants to know, have you visited or heard of the Rodale Institute farm? Maybe even used any of their research info? Yes, I have, Dean. You know why? Because the Rodale Institute happens to like a certain podcast that I know of. Google Rodale Institute favorite podcast. Okay, never mind. Don't Google it. <laughs> a long time ago, the Rodale Institute put out an article. Maybe it was in their magazine. Anyway, uh, they mentioned Homesteady as one of their favorite agricultural podcasts. Uh, but I can't find it now. So. I think it was Rodale Institute. Maybe it was a different one. You Google people out there, if you're good at Googling. I, I searched Rodale, Homesteady, the words. Yeah, can't find it. It was cool when it happened. It was a long time ago. Candace wants to know, when are you breeding Ladybug again? Uh, as soon as she comes into heat. We looked like we had just missed when we got back from our trip her last heat, so the next one, which would be probably in November. Candace also wants to know, is Luna a mini, not a mid-sized mini like Ladybug? That's correct, Candace. Ladybug is a mid-sized mini jersey. Luna is a actual mini. Now, I can't say that for certainty because she hasn't finished growing and a mini is a height thing. You just measure them and see, are they a mini or a mid-sized mini? But she was bred to a, Ladybug was bred to a mini, so Luna will most likely be a mini. I should say Ladybug was bred to a mini bull when Luna was being made. Yeah. Jocelyn wants to know, she saw my hunting videos, she didn't see me wearing blaze orange, why not? That depends, a lot of comments popped up from that one. If you live on your own land, in PA, you don't have to, if you're hunting your own family land, you don't have to wear blaze orange. If I were to go onto public land, I would. Uh, if I were to go onto other properties, I would. I would also want to. Here on our land, I'm the only one who's hunting. I know that. I'm on the property every day. I know there's no poachers out there, uh, so I'm not worried. I don't wear it. Uh, however, during rifle season, that will change. I will wear blaze orange during rifle season because even someone who is on a different property could be shooting in my direction and I want them to see. Right now it's only archery season and I'm not required to on my personal property. That may be different in your state though, so don't take my word as what you can do in your state. And laws like this change all the time, so comment below if something's changed in PA, guys. Last time, as for all the years I've hunted here, I haven't had to do it. Candace, a different Candace with a K, wants to know how is life in the tiny apartment? Is it what you expected? Candace, great question. Life in the tiny apartment has been great. Uh, we designed it with our use in mind and it has filled that use really, really well. We have always known it was temporary. We would not want to live in there our whole life. As our kids get older, they will need their own space and their own you know, specific rooms. At least the boys and the girls having a room to share. The boys will share a room, a girl, the girls will share a room. Um, but it's been, it's been great. It was a really well-designed spot. I like being close to the barn. As we approach winter, it's not gonna be, we will not be sad if the house building finishes up when we get in the big house because it is a big metal building. We're on the you know, second story. 
So there's the cold. <laughs> and it's a cold, you know, fortunately we have heaters and there's heat. But it's electric heat and that gets expensive. So it'll be nice to be in the big house. But that space for what we designed it for and what we've been using it for, it's pretty much as we expected. And it's been really, really nice. It's a really great space. And I'm excited to be able to use it as a guest space once we move into here because we do get a lot of guests visiting from Connecticut and it'll be a really nice place to have our guests. And it'll be nice to be able to use it like that. Uh, I have enjoyed being in it, but now that winter's coming, I'm ready to get into the big house when it's ready, when the other house is done. So that might not be, that might be springtime, we'll see. Building this year with all the rain we've had in Pennsylvania has been slow. Uh, we get asked this from time to time and it kind of tied in with that other question we had uh, you saw in a video last week, Kay and I were both working on a fencing project and the kids were nowhere to be seen. And people said, oh, do you mind if I ask who's watching the kidlets? <laughs> if the kids are not with us, or, you know, while we're outside on the farm, uh, they're being watched either by family members or friends. And, uh, yep, they're always watched by somebody. They're too young to be left alone on the homestead. <laughs> Kristen, long time no see, Kristen, where you been? Uh, good to see you back, Kristen. She says, I know you've used sex semen in the past, but if Luna or Ladybug have a bull calf, will you raise it for beef? Not sure if you meant that we haven't used it, Kristen, because we haven't. We've never used sex semen. But uh, if Luna or Ladybug have a bull calf, yes, we would definitely raise it for beef. The only thing that would change that is if someone reached out and said, hey, I like your genetics. I want to buy that bull. I want to breed that bull, sure, I'd sell the bull, but if they do have a, a, a bull calf, then I have no problem eating a bull calf. That's what most bull calves are good for, and that's, we don't want to have a bull on the property, a, a large bull, an adult bull, uh, so that bull calf would be turned into meat, and I would enjoy that meat. Apparently Jersey meat, Jersey beef is supposed to be very good. Maybe you know, Kristen, maybe you've tried it. Let us know if you have. The last question, good thing, because I'm getting a sore throat. Ugh. Jordan, would you consider using a woofing program for farm slash homesteading labor? This is, we go back to nothing is free and the customer is always right, right? We talked about that with getting grants from the government. When you own a farm or a homestead, if you have a big enough operation, uh, this program, if you don't know what woofing is, it's volunteers from all over the world who go work at organic farms. Um, I don't know all the details about woofing. I've never looked into it a lot. I just know the basics. So you can correct me in the comments below if there's some specifics I've missed. But essentially, you go online, you say, hey, I'll take some volunteers, and you provide them with a place to stay on the farm. I don't know if you're supposed to provide them with food, probably. Uh, but there's, woofing isn't the only one, and that's, it was good, Jordan asked a woofing program. So something like that where you provide room and board and maybe some food and maybe some little bit of money in return for labor. The idea is you're getting cheap labor. <laughs> Nothing is free. So if you're getting people on your property and you're getting their labor, it's not for free. You're providing them with housing. And that's at the ex ex expense, that's at, at the, at your housing's ex expense. So your homestead and your farm, your little piece of serenity and quiet and bliss now has people on it that you don't know, that are strangers, that might not be totally aware of what they've signed up for. I had a good buddy back home, another neighbor farmer who had some people on, he had a large farm business and he had some people come through and work on this business. And again, I won't say which neighbor farmer it is because we're talking about something kind of negative here. Uh, but a farmer who was in my same area, New Milford, in my same area back in Connecticut. And, uh, he had people come through that were like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll live on the property and that'll, you know, we'll work for where we're living and, and then we'll just get, you know, earn a little bit of money extra doing something else. And it never really worked out. People always left angry because 
they didn't realize how much work it actually is to run a farm. And you spend the first week, you're like, this is amazing. Look at, I'm in this beautiful place and I'm working in the dirt. And then the week after that, you're like, oh man, isn't this great? I'm working in the dirt on this property. I love it. And then the next week, you're like, oh man, whoo, it is hot today. Oh, I got, I am so dirty. Oh, it is hot. And then the next week you're like, oh man, I could make so much more money if I just like had a YouTube channel. Oh, I am, I am not getting paid enough for this. My back hurts every day after pulling up these beats. I, I should be getting more money for this. I, I, they should be paying me. I mean, I know I'm getting a place to stay, but like, it's not worth it. This is a lot of work. And then you have like a mean conversation where you're like, you know, you should really pay me money for this. I got to make money somehow. I, I got other, you know, I got to pay for car insurance. It just doesn't, it, I, I find people wind up, I've never seen it work where both sides were like, that was awesome. You enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. We both felt mutually happy with the situation. So no, I'm not super into the idea. I also don't really like the idea for the fact that I don't really know much about people showing up. You know, you get a profile, hey, you know, Pete wants to come and work on your farm and learn about cows and he's a hard worker and he's a nice guy and look at his smiling profile picture. But then like, you know, Pete's up late at night making a bunch of noise in his stinky tent and you're like, Pete, I got kids. Can you, you know, quiet down past bedtime? And Pete's like, Hey man, this is my my house, this tent. We like, one of the reasons we like homesteading is because we like privacy. We like being away from the road. We like not having to deal with people we don't know. We don't like, you know, people just showing up. And for what they're giving you, labor, I, I don't need the help with the labor. We didn't grow our homestead bigger than what we could handle. And that's an important lesson. Don't grow your homestead bigger than what you can handle. If you want to run a farm business, treat it like a business and pay for your employees. Just give them money and tell them, go away at five o'clock. Don't be living on my property. And if you don't want to run a farm business, well then don't grow your homestead so big that you need to have people that you're trying to trade room and board for. Because if you're giving them room and board, then you have to give them that. You have to like let them have their house tent. And what comes along with their house tent? Like, you know, they gotta shower and they gotta cook something and they gotta make noise. And, and then you got that on your property. So it comes at a cost. Just cause you got free labor, now you gotta stare at Pete while he's taking a towel shower. And you know, I mean, it just gets awkward. So I have not considered it what we have done, and again, I'm not familiar exactly with how woofing works, so maybe this would kind of work into some of their program. What we have done is we have done workshops. It's a day thing. People pay for a ticket. They show up. They get taught things. That's what they're paying for, the experience, the hands-on education. In return, what do we get? We get the labor for one day. People showed up. We planted our orchard at Squash Hollow Farm with that exact system. So. We sold tickets, they were very cheap. They mostly just uh, paid for the education you were gonna get that day. And after you were done with the education, you went and you planted a tree. That's what I got from it. I got a bunch of people to plant a bunch of trees for me. It was one day. I got to meet some really great Homesteady fans. That's nice, because they're not just some random person. They already kind of know the deal. Uh, but then at the end of the day, I shook everybody's hand, thanked them for their hard work, and I didn't have to watch anybody take a towel shower. <laughs> So <laughs> that's, that's it. There's, there's, a, there's a line and that's our line. We liked like the one day workshop things pretty cool. Thanks for watching this week's Ask Homesteady. If you want to get a question answered, just add the hashtag Ask Homesteady. And uh, I will, I got to all last week's questions. So I will try to get your question if you have that hashtag in there. If you like what we do, we, we, this is our business. And if you like five days a week getting a video from us, you can be sure you always get that by becoming a Homesteady Pioneer. There's a link below. It's five bucks a month. You get bonus content. You get discounts to homesteading stuff, uh, courses that I've taught. You can watch the apple planting workshop that we did. We filmed that workshop, the, the class that 
Dave from Northeast Edible taught that day. You can watch the whole, I think it's like an hour long presentation on putting an orchard in at your homestead. You can watch it, five bucks a month, you get all that instantly. So become a pioneer or without spending a penny extra, shop on Amazon in your URL, www.amsteady.com. Enter, forward you on to Amazon, amsteady.com. Uh, we get a bonus for sending you there and that helps us do this show. So thank you so much for watching and answering and supporting us whatever ways you do. And we will see you in next week's videos because I'm going horse.